there we were. It was just me and Milo. We had done a little bit of our research as much as we could, and we knew that this could go south. So we had driven two and a half hours to Concord, and uh, we met a guy <laughs> that we found on Craigslist. <laughs> okay, yeah, some of you know. And uh, we were going to sell something. In this case, we were selling a lot of some of my old silver coins. We met a guy online. says, I buy silver. Like, what could go wrong? There's nothing sketchy at all about this. So I get there a half hour early, and I pick a, a public place. I pick Great Wolf Lodge, because I knew where that was. And I said, Milo, you're going to go with me. You're going to be my backup, my security. And we're going to get there early. We're going to back up under the entrance. You know what I'm talking about? Where I can see everybody coming and going. Nothing's going to sneak up on me. It's going to be awesome. Okay, we're ready to go. I got protection. We're ready to go. So I back in, and I look at Milo. and I said, now listen, son. Been meaning to have this talk with you for a while. If, if I die today, you, you're in charge. You're the, you're the man of the house. No sooner had I started just kind of teasing about it, my phone rang. And it said, unknown. Who has this note? This is either going to be extending my car warranty or it's going to be the guy. And I said, hello, is this Matt? Yes, sir. <laughs> Who's this? I'm the buyer. Like, it sounds like a drug deal, doesn't it? It's always, I mean, these things are about to go horribly wrong. I'm like, I feel guilt. I should feel guilt. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm like, hey, hey, uh, how's it going? He goes, I'm good. What are you driving? I said, I'm driving a green 20-year-old uh, Ford F-150. He goes, got it. And I said, where are you? And he says, I'm behind you. I look in the rear view mirror. The dude somehow has snuck up behind me in his silver Mercedes and had quietly crept up. I think he ran my plates. I think this guy... He knew everything about me. We get out of the car. I said, Milo, why don't you stay here? Let me go meet this guy. I come around the corner. I'm like, hey, how you doing, buddy? Shake his hand. And he's like, hey, it's good to see you. And I said, uh, we made some small talk. And I said, well, I guess, I guess you want to see, see the merchandise. It just sounds so wrong, right? You want to see the goods, right? So I go around. I open the, the side door where Milo is. I'm like, stay there, buddy. And I open it. It's got a back door to the truck, a little suicide door that kind of opens. So it formed this little cocoon where I thought we would be safe from prying. I just people everywhere. I felt really safe. People walking by, people in, you know, bathing suits. They're getting ready to go inside Great Wolf Lodge. And I'm standing there, and he says, so what do you think, Milo? And I'm like, did I tell him my son's name? And he said, uh, your dad just had a birthday. Was that fun? And I'm like, what? Surely I did not tell him all this. And he said, what do you think of your new house? What is that, three bedrooms, two baths? Over there on uh, Evening Star Drive. I'm like, what is going, turns out the dude is CIA. He is a retired CIA, ex-secret service, has accessed my database, sat, he was running my place, he knows everything about me. He was looking at my house two hours over here at Apex, knew everything about me. Then I open my little safe, I show him my coins, he reaches in his satchel. Are you ready for this? And he pulls out a stack of $100 bills. $10,000. I wasn't even asking for $10,000. Pulls it out, and he throws it on the front seat. He says, Milo, you want to count that? And I was like, yeah, Milo, you count that. <laughs> so you know what? So I need a volunteer. Let's do this. I need a volunteer. Anybody willing to, to do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, you, long hair. Yeah, come on up here, right? I'm so jealous. I had hair like this once. This is so... <laughs> All right, so I tell you, you stay right there, okay? We haven't set this up ahead, right? We've known each other for a little bit, but we've never said. From where you are, would you say this is authentic or fake? Or is it too hard to tell? Going to go with fake, okay? How many agree with her? All right, take two steps closer. Okay, now. Do you want to change your answer? Do you think this is authentic or fake? Or do you want to take one step closer? You're going to go with fake? All right. Take one step closer. I don't want you You can take it, hold it up, examine it, hold it up to the light. I feel like this one's fake now. Wait, no, no, no. This one's real now. You feel like this one is authentic yeah, and one. this is fake. Yeah. Okay, do you want to change your answer? You good? You made the right call. All right, yes, that's yours, by the way. You take that back to your seat. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Pays to come to church, y'all, I'm telling you. $10,000 in fake. Now, why did he do this? 
I asked him, I said, what is going on? He says, listen, once we started talking, this guy's awesome, love this guy. We've actually stayed in contact, got his email and stuff. He said, if I show up to a buy, this is what he does for his retirement. He buys bullion and gold and so on. He says, if I show up and the guy is shady and I feel like my life is in danger, I take this $10,000 of movie prop money and I throw it at the guy and I say, just keep it, it's yours. And I get in my car and go. And he is distracted every single time. And it gives me enough time to get to safety. Because he lo it looks real on the surface. It looks authentic to him. Does that make sense? And while he's busy doing that, this guy has made his getaway. So today, I want us to wonder, as we evaluate our own life, what does it mean to be an authentic Christian? What is auth authentic faith? And what is synthetic faith? If somebody were to ask you to define it, in fact, if you were to go out on the street and ask somebody, 10 different people, hey, how would you define an authentic faith? What is authentic Christianity? I bet you would get 10 different answers. No wonder there's so much confusion. Everybody has an opinion. But you know what matters? This. This is where we find truth. This is what matters. Because this doesn't change with culture. This doesn't change with votes. This doesn't change with the latest whim. It doesn't change with my feelings. Y'all know how I feel about feelings. Mm. Your feelings will lie to you. You might feel one thing one day, and the next day it's totally changed. Now, if I were to ask you to define authentic, most of us have a pretty good grasp of this. You think you understand that. So let's just kind of go through it. I want to define authentic, and then I want to define synthetic. Authentic obviously means believable, reliable, genuine. It's real. Does that make sense so far? Synthetic, on the other hand, means not real. It's artificial or imitating a genuine or a natural product. I love that. Read that last part. Imitating the real thing. Imitating a genuine or a natural product. And it gives an example. For example, synthetic rubber or synthetic oil. Anybody use synthetic oil? Anybody heard of synthetic oil? Yeah. The first time my mechanic told me I needed to switch, I laughed at him. I thought, what is that? Are you making, he's playing me. I thought he was joking. Like, you can't make synthetic, fake oil. What a fad. It'll never last, <laughs> right? Right? I had a guy in my very first church. This is way back in the 80s. I wish I could remember his name. He came up to me and says, hey, Matt, did you hear the news? I'm like, no, I don't. I was associate pastor, little church in Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, Alabama, God bless America. Roll Tide, please help us win another championship. So we, we have this conversation. He says, I tell you what, I got some good news. We've been working on this product, me and my partner, and we had a breakthrough recently. And we're about to go public with it, and it's going to be huge. And I'm like, okay, all right, good luck with that, buddy. Totally dismissed him. He said, no, no, you don't understand. It's going to be big. And I plan to tithe on this. I was like, what's that? He said, I plan to tithe on that, like 10%. And I said, okay, well, still, good luck with that. You know, some synthetic fuel additive thing. Fast forward just a few months, and this guy has a product all over. He invented Slick 50, and he's got it sold in every Walmart, every AutoZone, every O'Reilly Auto Parts. Ow! All those things that you see on the shelves. His stuff is everywhere. And I dismissed him because I thought it was a fake. Man, I wish I'd stayed in touch with that guy. Right? What about you? When somebody looks at you, do they think you have an authentic faith? Could you describe it? Today I want us to look at the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to look at authentic faith and synthetic faith and see which one we choose. By the choices we make, you have the opportunity to go from a fake faith to the real deal. So if you're here today and you are checking us out, or maybe you're listening online, you're, you're on one of our, our streams, today is an awesome day for a fresh start. Everyone here can have a do-over, a fresh start, and go from in, uh, inauthentic, synthetic, to the real deal. All right, so the context of what's happening here, in Mark chapter 3, we see that Jesus is teaching. He's sharing some truth grenades. He is dropping his bombs, and, and people are like just grasping this stuff. What is he saying? And then some of his relatives come to see him. And word was sent to Jesus while he was teaching, hey, I think some of your family's out here. I think your family wants to see you. And he has the most bizarre response on the surface. Look what he says. And he answered them, really, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who are seated around him, listening to him teach, he says, right here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. In other words, he's saying the one who allows God to rule their life, 
their faith is authentic. They are authentically related to me. You can become grafted into his family. So the idea here is that those who take God's word seriously, who get it, who repent of sin, who come forward and say, Lord, I want you to be the one in charge. Those are the ones who get to say they are my family. They are authentic Christianity. By knowing and doing the will of God, we move from what's called self-rule to God rule. All right? So every one of us has a choice. Every one of us gets to decide between God rule or self-rule. Now, as you look at this, there's a choice to make. And as we, as we consider this, we have to know God's will. And if we're going to know God's will, we have to be in his word. We have to be among people who believe God is who he says he is. And then Jesus comes through his scriptures and he invites us to what I call the great exchange, where he says, if you surrender your will to me, if you give me your life, I will give you one far greater. It's an incredible exchange. Our life replaced by him living in us. Jesus says this in Mark 8. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, okay? Let him, let him put himself aside and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life, that who, whoever clings to his own life, so tightly, my precious, I'm in charge. If you do that, you will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Do you catch what's happening here? This is a great exchange. And I want us to notice a couple things in this verse. Jesus is making it very clear that we can't be his followers if we are following our own selfish agenda. Did you catch that? We can't claim to be followers of Christ. We can't claim to be his disciples if we're only worried about our own agenda. If we're following our own selfish ambitions. In fact, he says following his rule actually means shouldering a cross. He's using this powerful symbolic imagery. That was a, an instrument of death. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. You see, I want you to be all in. This is not some lighthearted, pray a little prayer and all will be perfect in your world. He's not saying that. He's saying the cost of discipleship is radical. That would be like today if I were to go and strap on an electric chair and put it on my back and say, come, take your electric chair and follow me. It was an instrument of death. It was torture. And everyone living in that time would know it. But today, we gold plate it. We idolize it. We, put it. we put it around our necks. We wear it. We have kind of taken the punishment of what the cross really meant. So when Jesus said, I want you to pick up your own cross and follow me, people were in the room like, what's that? <laughs> say that? Did he just say we're going to die? Well, if need be. So, you know, I got to ask, how committed are you? If you've been a follower of Christ for a long time, how committed are you? If you're not yet a follower of Christ, consider the cost. But I want to show you what you gain in return. We have the chance to be reconciled to the God who made us. To have the cloud of shame and guilt removed to where we can be in relationship with God. Think of it like this. Somebody is going to be Lord of your life. Somebody is in charge. Whether you know it or not, Somebody is in charge. And if you don't know who, it's you. If you haven't made the decision to change that, it is you. Someone will be seated on the throne of your heart. Okay, so is it yourself or is it Christ? Look at it like this. Here's a self-directed life. In this illustration, self is on the throne. You see yourself, you're in charge, you're calling the shots. Christ, you may not be anti-Christ. You may not be, you may even be pro-God and happy to, God's fine. But he's way out here. He's outside your life. And he doesn't really impact anything. He's just part of it. Maybe he is a nice add-on. You talk to him occasionally on Sunday, maybe float up a prayer before a test, and that's about it. You know about God, but you don't really know God. And your life is marked with confusion and frustration and tedium. Do I got to get up again today and go do that job I hate? and earn some money that I really don't get enough of, and I go to bed, and I wake up tomorrow, and I do it all again, and I go to bed, and I wake up the next day, and I do it all again. Shampoo, lather, rinse, repeat. I don't have to do that much anymore, but you guys do. That's a self-directed life. Let me show you what a Christ-directed life looks like. In this illustration, Jesus has authority. He is given permission to be the center part of your life. And you bear these kind of characters, this kind of fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know all this. And the results are incredible. This is just a few. 
You get to trust God. Your prayer life moves mountains. You get to share the good news. One beggar telling another where we found food. You get to introduce others. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And your life is Christ-centered. And you have peace and joy and passion. But sadly, so many people pick the first one. They pick self-rule. That's our default, by the way. You don't have to choose that. That's actually how we're born. We're born wanting our own way. I get it. I was. Maybe you were too. The majority of the people choose this. This is the easy choice. The Bible says broad is the road that leads to destruction. We just talked about this just yesterday. We were talking about this. But sadly, narrow is the road that leads to life. And far, far fewer choose that road. That's on us. We're the ones who are supposed to tell people about this. True life satisfaction only comes when we swap out our small little ideas for God's huge love and picture for you. That old cliche is so accurate. God does love you, and he does have a phenomenal, incredible plan for your life. Someone once said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Because <laughs> they're so tiny. They're so little. We're playing in the little kiddie pool. And God says, turn around. I have this ocean for you. And we're like, no, but God, I like the mud puddles. And the you know, and he's like, stop that. Look over here. I have all of this. I have greater satisfaction and joy, and it's only found by reconciling with your creator. Authentic faith leads you to run to Jesus. Synthetic faith leads you to run away from him. Right? So every one of us has a choice to make. Whether you're watching online, whether you're here in the big room, we will all choose one way or the other. We will choose repentance, or we will choose to retreat back into our cocoon, our way of living, our self-centered philosophy. Christianity, th there is a problem with the way we live in our modern society, especially Christianity in the West. We have forgotten the lost art of repentance. Did you know that? Of recognizing that, hey, sometimes, you know, we don't have it all together. Sometimes we do wrong. Sometimes we blow it. And when we do that, we need to apologize. There are marriages who need to get that. Some of us men need to man up when we've wronged our spouse and say we're sorry. It's not easy. But you can't find repentance until you own it, until you agree with God about the hideousness of our sin. You say, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done that much. Guys, unrighteousness is unrighteousness. One of the things that marks authentic faith is when we feel conviction and we're willing to do something about it. Do you feel that? Before I was a Christian, I would call that my conscience is bothering me, or I feel guilt and shame. But that comes from the enemy. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. That is God saying, hey, psst, I've got something better for you. What you're doing, that's not meant for you. Come over here. I've got something better. I want to exchange it. And it always blows my mind that our instinct is to run from the one person who can help us. You notice that? Our instinct is to hide. We've been doing that from the stinking beginning. Look at the Garden of Eden. Look at Adam and Eve. Look at what they did. When Adam sinned, man, they had perfect fellowship. It literally said God would come and walk with them in the cool of the day, and they would have open fellowship, and it was phenomenal. Can you imagine walking with God literally? And then they blew it. And once Adam sinned, guess what he did? He went and he hid. Can you imagine hiding from God? I, like, I, I just picture him. He's like, I hear God coming. I know I've sinned. I'm going to go hide. He won't see me. How do you hide from God? It would be like me trying to hide behind this microphone stand. Like, you can't see me. Um, no, I'm pretty sure we can. What about now? God's coming. Shh, Eve, be quiet. You can't see me. I have mastered the art of standing incredibly still to where God can't find me. Do you see how laughable that is? That's what Adam did. And he knew, the only one who knew perfect, unbroken fellowship. We do the same thing. We do it all the time. We just don't realize that we're doing that. We have to turn to Jesus, and that begins with repentance. Jesus began his whole ministry with this verse in Mark 1, 14. He says, he came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, folks, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the gospel. All right, so here's the message God's word is saying to us today. We, in order to have an authentic faith, need to turn away from our sins and turn to Christ. That is step one. That is, it is that simple. Don't complicate it. We need to turn away from our sins. That means forsake them. Quit doing them. Turn to Christ. 
and believe the good news that Jesus and Jesus alone has the power to offer forgiveness. He has the power to say, give me that and I will wipe the slate clean. That's what leads to an authentic faith. But you know what the synthetic faith does? They see sins, because I've been there, and maybe you have too. And they say, you know what? I haven't really done a whole lot. You know, I'm just, I'm just like everybody else. And they say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sweep it under the rug. I'm just going to put it over here. God won't notice. And we say, you know, it's just been those two. I don't really commit any other sins. I don't really have any big issues. Besides, is God really even aware of my sins? We say, God, you know, I'm not really that bad. I don't really do anything different than my buddies. You know, we're kind of, you know at least I don't do the big ones, right? I, just, I would never be a part of these. So God, why don't we just back off and let me have my fun? I'll live my life, you know? I'm not against you, God. Not, and we say, I'm not really any that different. And then God comes along and says, you think so? Well, let me show you this sin. Okay, I want you to put your sin, just write whatever that's besetting you and constantly tell you, go ahead and write it on this ball, okay? It's our sin. We say, well, oh, this one, it's not really that big. You know what? I'm just going to sweep it under the carpet too. We're just going to just put it right, right here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's gone. Ta-da. This is what we do. We say, God, there's not really, you know, I don't, but, oh, this? <laughs> no, this, this is, this is nothing. It's flat. It's good. Ship shape. We're good, right? Nothing to see here. Move along. And God says, really? Because I think I see something right here. And if you just give me that, you don't have to hide it. I will take it. If you will surrender this to me, I will nail this to my cross, and it will be dealt with forever. I'll take your penalty that you owe, and I'll pay the debt. Wow. Who wouldn't want that? Sadly, millions reject that. You have a chance today to say, God, you've opened my eyes. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for taking my sin. I don't have to hide it. I, don't, I can bring it out in the open. I can acknowledge it, and now I can repent. So what exactly is repentance? I want to define it a little bit, and I want to tell you what repentance is and what it's not, because there's so much confusion, and I want to dispel a few myths by clarifying first what repentance is not. Repentance is not remorse, and a lot of people get this mixed up. See, repentance is not simply being sorry <laughs> that we've sinned, or shall I say being sorry that we got caught. Right? There's a lot of people who are sorry once they get caught. We see this all the time. Celebrities caught in scandals. Politicians, right? I love how they refuse to own it. They have the best saying. They come out, <clears throat> press conference, just want to acknowledge something. Mistakes were made. Right? And it's this big, broad thing. That is the ultimate non-acceptance of responsibility. You know, or, I'm sorry your feelings were hurt. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you did not own that. The proper thing I meant to say to my wife is, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. Do you see the difference? What? Don't say amen. What is that? Do we need to talk? I thought we were good. All right. You see the difference? One is just remorse. I'm sorry. You know, I got caught. And, you know, repentance can have remorse, and that can lead to that. But repentance is so much more than that. You remember the rich young ruler? He goes up to Jesus, he's a disciple, or he wants to be a disciple, he thinks. He owns the world. He's got everything going for him, except he's lost. He doesn't know true faith and authentic faith. So he comes up to Jesus, he's like, hey, tell me what I need to do to be saved. How do I, I'm, I'm all in, I'm all in. And Jesus says, you sure about that? He goes, oh yeah, I'm all in. Woohoo! let's do this. And Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Let's see what you got. And the rich old ruler's like, what's that? And the next verse says, he went away sorrowful because he had great wealth. It was his handcuffs. His golden handcuff, but handcuffs. He went away sorrowful. You see, you see what happened? He, 
He was remorseful, but he wasn't willing to repent and be all in. And one of the reasons so many people falter in their faith today is because they're trying to substitute remorse for repentance. And it is not enough to simply feel sorry or slightly troubled by my transgressions. That's not repentance. Mistakes were made. Baloney, I have sinned. And until I am willing to own that and say, God, I agree with you, can you fix me? There's no hope. Until I'm willing to admit that. Repentance is also, it's not regret. Lots of people have regret. People live with that all. It's not merely wishing the deed had never happened <laughs> or regretting it. You want to look at a biblical example of this? Look no farther than Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor who had the chance to free Jesus. Jesus has been beaten and he's ready and Barabbas could be released or Jesus. And he thought, oh, we'll see. I don't really think this guy's guilty, but, you know, whatever. Hey, whatever y'all want. And they said, give us Barabbas. Kill that Jesus guy. And Paul is like, well, I don't think you understand. <laughs> it's like, this guy's not really done anything, right? Isn't that, isn't that what y'all said? I don't know. He's your guy. See what he's at? He's distancing himself. And then, as if that's not enough, he says, I'll tell you what, bring me a bowl with water in it. And in front of everybody, he dips his hands and says, I wash my hands of this. His sin will not be on me. Oh, no, no, no. See what he did there? He's passing the buck. I'm sure he regretted this whole event. But notice he did not repent. And many people regret, but they do not repent. And in doing that, they tragically fool themselves of where they stand with a holy and a righteous God. Repentance is also not resolve. How many times every few years do we make these resolutions? I hereby resolve, this is really the year I will lose 634 pounds. This is it. This is the year I will regrow my hair. I will try very hard. Right? We make all these resolutions that by January 7th, they're done. We resolve to get better fitness. Or we resolve to take our finance goals to a new level or our marriage or you fill in the blank. We want to live life on this higher plane of excellence. We know that God has called us to these things, but we fail to do it, and that's because we're attempting to do it in our flesh. We attempt, I'm going to do it. Gonna, we substitute our own resolve for genuine repentance. Only Christ can offer forgiveness of sin. And the last thing that repentance is not is reform. Repentance is not just simply turning over a new leaf. I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to reform my ways this time. God, I'm sorry. You know who's a great example of this? The betrayer. Judas Iscariot himself. This was so classic. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But something strange happened in the last moments of his life. It was almost like he was trying to reform his ways. He goes back to the temple, and he throws the silver back at those who had paid him the bribe, the bribe that he was fine taking just earlier. He throws it back in the temple to, to those who brought it. See, Jesus reformed, or Judas reformed his ways just enough to return the blood money, but unfortunately for him, he did not repent. And there is a gulf, a mile wide indifference. We could try to reform and say, I'm going to be better, but he didn't repent. In fact, he's the only one mentioned in all of Scripture that after he died and he transgressed, he went to his own place. It's very mysterious. It's in the book of Acts. You can read it sometime. He, he, he says he went to his own place. There's something about his lack of repentance here that he gets that very unique line in Scripture. There's no amount of remorse, regret, resolve, or reformation that will substitute for repentance. So what is repentance? Ah, I'm glad you asked. The original Greek actually translates repent as literally changing one's mind. It means I was walking this way, and I literally am going to turn my back. I am going to change my mind on my sin. I'm literally going to put my back to it and say, I forsake it. From this moment forward, I am done. Jesus is going to be my Lord. He is, and here's the easiest way to know if repentance, if true life change, if conversion has taken place in your life. You will begin to bear fruit. There will be life change. Look for fruit in your life. Are you bearing good things that come from knowing a God for real and not just knowing about a distant God? See, once you have that defining conversation with the Lord where you humbly tell him, God, I have made a mess of my life. It's not a total train wreck, but I can see the cliff coming. And if I'm honest, I'm just spinning my wheels. Can you fix it? I don't have a whole lot to offer you. 
But all I've got is yours, if you want it. Will you, will you sweep me clean? Holy Spirit, will you invade my life right now? Will you just come and, and wipe me clean? Will you be my Lord? Will you forgive my sin and make me a new creation as I read about in your, your book? See, the easiest way to know if repentance, a true life change, has happened is there will be fruit in your life. You'll notice that you began to dislike that which you used to love. Some of you are smiling because you know after you came to Christ. There are certain things that used to have a sway, a hold over your life that God breaks those chains. Sometimes it's overnight, sometimes it's a process, but that bondage that you were in has been snapped. And you find yourself, wait a minute, I don't even want to do this anymore. You begin to hate that which you used to love. But you know what's cool? The hibbity-flippity of that is true too. You begin to love that which you couldn't care less about. You begin to love things of the light. You begin to love church. You begin to have a holy hunger for things of God. You enjoy hanging out with like-minded believers, and you're drawn to good and righteous causes. And you'll notice that you now have peace and purpose and joy and a passion to get out of bed. This happens in three steps here. So if you kind of want to take a, an intellectual look, the first thing that happens is a new attitude. Repentance begins usually here intellectually first. It's a change of mind. I see a light. I hear what you're saying. God, I feel like there's something here. And that experience doesn't just stop here. A lot of people stop here. They know about God. They don't let it hear. And then there's a change of heart. That means our affections begin to change. You start bearing fruit. And finally, you'll notice that your will begins to change. And it's evident in your actions. Again, how do you know what kind of tree it is? By its fruit. You look at its fruit and you say, that's an apple tree. Right? So you know i got to ask. Don't hate me. Just your friendly neighborhood pastor. How's your fruit? You're bearing great fruit, rich, ripe fruit. The world can see. A lost person a mile off goes, that looks like authentic fruit. Or is it kind of <laughs> shriveled up and gnarly? <laughs> you know? It's okay. It happens. Just don't settle for that. Church, it's time. It's time to let God do a new thing where we surrender and we seek his forgiveness and we forsake the sin that so easily entangles us. And we say, today, no more. Some of you right now are dealing with the sin that has wrapped you up for years. I don't know what it is. You say, oh, he's talking to me. I, no, <laughs> I just know humanity. Today's the day to break loose of that. To let God to just leave that at the altar. Don't, don't sweep it under the rug. Don't do that anymore. We've done that enough. Take that big old sin and say, I'm done. God, will you take it? I'm so tired of carrying this around. I give it to you. I'm done. But you can do that today. I love what Jesus says. And Paul was talking about this repentance, and he says, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The prodigal son is the perfect illustration of this. You all remember this. If you hadn't heard the story, he's a rebellious young man. And he goes up to his dad. He's got an older brother. And he says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance, and I want it today. I want it right now. You know, his dad was still alive. <laughs> So it's essentially coming up going, Dad, I know you're kind of wealthy, and I know when you die, I'm going to get a lot. So guess what? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and die? That's what he's saying. It was, people were gasping. What? The dad, full of grace, says, okay, son. And he gives him his half of the inheritance. Older brother's like, what are you doing? So I'm giving him what he asked for. And he goes off. Y'all know the story. He lives wild. He is living the wild life. He's got wine and women. He's spending nine bucks on Starbucks coffees and buying skinny jeans. And he blows through his whole inheritance like that. And it may be months. We don't know the, the exact date, but we know this. One day, he's so broke, he has no other job. He's sitting in a pig pen feeding gross hogs, unclean hogs, by the way. He's feeding them. And he looks in his hand, and he sees the pods that he's feeding these nasty animals. 
And he says to himself, I would eat this if there was enough. But the owner of the hogs wouldn't even give him enough. And then it happens. He has what Luke calls an aha moment. It says literally, he came to himself. He says, what am I doing? And he changed his mind. Remember I said it starts here first. He changed his mind. He knew right then. And then he has a change of heart. He says, I will arise and I will go back to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned. And I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. But I'll tell you what, if you'll just take me back, I'll be a servant. You don't even have to pay me. Even your servants eat better than I am over here. Will you just take me back? That's what I'll do. I'll arise and I'll go back to my father. His heart changed and then his actions, his will preceded that. Verse 20 says, so he arose and he went home. Oh, what a beautiful line. He went home. And when he came home, guess where his dad was? He was looking for him. I bet he never stopped. All those days. What is he doing? He's looking for that wayward son, the one who took everything and left and spent it all. Yeah, that one. He looked. And when his dad saw him a mile off, he runs. He says, go kill the fatty calf. We're going to have a party. Woohoo! That's my son. He was lost, and he's home. Now he's found. And they have this huge party. I'm talking a big soiree. And they are hugging and dancing, and there's laughter. And it was, y'all, that's exactly what our Heavenly Father wants to do for us. In his patience and his kindness, he stands ready to welcome us home. So we think repentance, oh my gosh, that's so hard. I don't know. No, no, it's God's goodness. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. He reaches out and he says, hey, take my hand. Come on home. Come on home. I don't care what you've done. I'll pay that debt. Do you see how awesome God's? People go, I can't believe in a God who would send anyone to hell. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose this. We reject that love. That love is available for everybody. I just, I read a story a while back of a pastor who had had enough, and he went, he was vacationing with his family, and they picked this condo, this, this cabin out in the Smoky Mountains, and they rented this old farmhouse type log cabin up on the side of a mountain, and he said, I'm finally going to get away, and during the daytime, man, this place was beautiful, and it was awesome, and he brought his little two or three daughters with him, his wife, but when the sun went down, <laughs> oh, creepyville, girls didn't like it. Daddy, this place is haunted. <laughs> it's like, what, where are we? But during the day, it was awesome. It looked great in the brochures. So they're there and having a great time this first day, and they're downstairs, and I imagine they're playing Monopoly and having fights just like you do, and seeing who's better in Risk and Clue and all these games, whatever. And the sun began to set. He noticed his daughters weren't wanting to go upstairs. And one by one, the daughters just kind of fell asleep on the sofa and on the chair around the kitchen table while they're playing their game. And he looked at his wife, and he knows. He's, they're scared. After a few hours, they're in a deep sleep. All of them are snoring. And his dad, the dad says, it's time, honey. I need to carry them up to their bed. I'm getting tired myself. So he takes his daughters upstairs, all the way up, and puts them each in their bed and tucks them in. He turns out the light, and he quietly creeps downstairs. Gives his wife a little smooch. A little hug, a little kissy, kissy. They go off to the master bedroom down in the lower corner. They settle in for what they just assume is going to be a routine, peaceful night of rest, breathing mountain air. And then it happened. The thing you all fear, every parent, he is awakened in the middle of the night, the dead of night with a blood-curdling scream from his seven-year-old. In an instant, that man is wide awake, heart pounding, cover thrown off, runs, takes the stairs two at a time, burst open the door, and there is standing his seven-year-old daughter, screaming, terrified, confused, totally disoriented, no clue how she got there, wondering what has happened. And she is screaming, and the dad comes over to him, puts his arms on her shoulders and says, sweetie, daddy's here. He looked at her and says, you're safe. Come here. And he embraced her. So, and she began to stop crying. She began to stop sobbing. And then he said, you know what? I need to do one thing more. And he took her by the hand and he led her down the stairs, told his wife to move over and put 
the scared daughter between them. Within seconds, that daughter was smiling and out, dead asleep again. Why? She took her daddy's hand. She's safe. Now, this is what God does for us. Just like that, our Heavenly Father, He finds us confused and doing our own thing. We're in the dark and we're scared and we're disoriented and he rescues us and he takes us by the hand by his own goodness, his own kindness and he leads us to repentance and says, I can make this right. But you take that step. You come. Jesus said it best. He says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's not a game. It's not some easy believism like, oh, I'm pro-Jesus. No, it's not. It's more than that. He goes on to say lovingly, he says, I'm not willing that any should perish. I want everyone to come to repentance. Everyone. You hear that? We choose this. So he provides a solution for the problem that he didn't even make. This is my problem. Being saved from perishing, using that word, is only possible by an authentic, personal repentance. And thankfully, his goodness rescued me. Rescued a lot of people in this room. Maybe rescued you listening online. Or maybe you're here today and this is the first time somebody has taken the moment it needed to share this. Today can be your day of repentance and rescue. And you will see that you bear rich fruit from this day on. And you will have the best sleep <laughs> you have had in a long time. We repent. and We follow the Lord. You can do that today. There's a fresh start waiting for anyone who wants it. So we're going to pray about it. Would you bow with me right where you are? Everybody just in, in the quiet of this moment, if you'll just close your eyes, tune out every distraction. This is just you and the Lord right now. We just bow. We just make this a, just an altar right where you're seated. If you have never taken the step to pray and invite the Lord to forgive you, it would be my absolute honor to do that. So in your own words, would you just pour out your heart to the Lord? Just tell him, God, in the quiet of this moment, I come before you. I believe your word. I believe what it says about you. I believe what it says about me. I need you. Your word says that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised from the dead, that you will save me. So God, I do believe. I do confess you as Lord. I do know you rose from the dead. You conquered death. You beat sin. You took my penalty, and you didn't even owe it. Thank you for dying on a cross, paying my sin debt. I accept what you did in my place. So here and now, Lord, I humbly repent. I publicly forsake my sin. I turn my back on my old life and I say, I am done. Will you be seated on my throne, God? Will you be the Lord that is on the throne of my heart? Will you send your Holy Spirit now to seal my life forever? I want to be on your team. I'm not asking you to be on mine, Lord. I want to be on your side. Thank you for providing a way. Forgive me of my sin. I install you as rightful Lord. Take the, take the throne, take the controls. You rightfully deserve it. We believe your promise, God, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a new creation. In Jesus' name, and with a grateful heart, I pray. Amen.